should be like to the rest of the United States of America. In that mighty name of Jesus, we pray for the leaders, the Lord, the wisdom that you will grant them. In the name of Jesus, we pray for the business owners, the Lord, small and great, that you will bless their businesses. In the name of Jesus, we pray for our law enforcement officers, the Lord, that you will protect and keep them. In the name of Jesus, as they put their lives on the line to protect and defend this city, that you are blessed them, dear Lord. Bless their families in the name of Jesus. And we pray for the rest of the first responders that you will keep them. We pray that you will just bless the city abundantly. We pray also for the food, that you will bless the hands of the preparers, and that the food will be strength and nourishment to our bodies. In the name of Jesus, we pray and we thank you. Amen. 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 I'm going to lead you with the Pledge of Allegiance to our country. Uh, please put your the right hand over your heart, face the flag. Now, let's begin together. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, Michael. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Barry Wade. I'm the President and CEO of the Carson Chamber of Commerce. And it's really nice to see you. I, I know we keep saying that lately, whenever we have in person, whenever any of us go to any person event and see more than three people. It's just so exciting. So thanks so much for being here today and for helping us um, celebrate um, the work of our uh, state senator and, uh, and sharing with us. So a few things. First, I wanted to acknowledge our sponsors. Um, Marathon Petroleum and Watson Land Company are presenting sponsors. Thank you very much. Other important sponsors for this event, Cal State Dominguez Hills, Cal Water Service, Dignity Hill Sports Park, Doubletree by Hilton Carson, nice place, <laughs> Golden State Water Company, Ineos Polymers USA, Kaiser Permanente, Phillips 66, Providence Health and Services, SA Recycling, uh, and now I lost my place, uh, Shell, and Southern California Edison Company. Let's all give them a round of applause. And I wanted to recognize some very important uh, people we have here. Uh, first, we have Councilman Cedric Hicks. Thanks for being with us today, Cedric. And I wanted to recognize we have three past mayors here. We have Gil Smith. Jerry DeWitt. And Al Robles. And uh, Vera will just keep on hitting you here. Vera is also our representative to the Water Replenishment District. And then I saw Carol Williams. There he is. <laughs> and Carol is a uh, past councilman and also past public works director. I, should say so who I started working with and I'm not going to tell you how many years ago now it's been here because it makes it sound old but uh, he is with West Basin Water so we have a lot of water representation here water we got water in the house that's a good thing uh let's see who else did I need to mention who have I missed? oh Captain Jones where'd you go Station Captain um
our city clerk, Leah Bradshaw's here. This is my first chance to introduce you, so that's exciting. So I've known you for years through Cal State Dominion Sales, and we are delighted to have her as part of the city family. And have, who else have I missed? Yeah. If you would allow me to introduce our brand new general manager of West Bay Springs Water. Thanks for being here today. And welcome to Carson. Oh, we have June from uh, Mike Gibson's office. June, I just think you has been one of my friends. <laughs> That's most of this crowd. Um, and we have our, oh, we're going to collect business cards here because if we don't announce you, then of course you somehow disappear. Remember, we used to do this for the uh, for the quarterly breakfast yes. when I go around getting the cards to put in the. That's right. Yeah. And we're going to have quarterly breakfast again soon. So the last quarter was really long. <laughs> Okay, so we have Chio Leslie and Jasmine Guerrero from uh, Senator Bradford's office. They're in the district office. Let me make sure I get your time. So my friend Chernell Blevins from, and okay, I got to get the whole thing here. Family and Community uh, Engagement Director from Board District 7. Which of course is almost all of Carson, except for a tiny piece. So, and uh, we have appreciated all the involvement that we've gotten from our board members' office. So, thank you. Okay, I probably missed a bunch of people, and I'm going to be in trouble later on. But um, that's how it goes. So, let's see what's next on our list. What's that? Let's eat. Oh. <laughs> I'm looking on the list like, what is that? Let's eat. So let's eat. All right, we'll back a little bit. So eat. Um, and we're going to check around and make sure you eat your vegetables. You don't eat your vegetables, no dessert. So welcome back. Hope you enjoyed your lunch. Keep on munching on your dessert, because if you don't finish your dessert, you can't have more vegetables. It's part of our new get tough policy. We have standards. So a uh, few people that I wanted to mention. We have Monica Cooper, our city treasurer, has joined us. And from Supervisor Holly Mitchell's office, we, we have Sarah Harris and Pamela Leo. And then somebody, if you don't know, you should know, if you want to get any business done in the city of Carson, Latoya Butler, I know there in the corner. So uh, next up, I wanted to uh, bring up uh, Steve Koenig from Marathon as one of our sponsors. He is going to uh, just share a few words. Steve is one of our major sponsors, so please welcome Steve. <laughs> Necessary, but uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Barry. You know, I'm, I'm going to forego the video. I had a nice video okay. that uh, I think people would enjoy, but uh, I'm in the interest of time. I'm going to keep things moving here. So I want to welcome everybody here. Uh, thank you for coming to this uh, fantastic state of the 35th district. Uh, you know, my my colleague Alan Caldwell, who many of you know, was supposed to be here. Unfortunately, he had to, to tend to a family matter today, so you've got me on the B team. But he wanted to uh, express his, uh, his thanks for being here and uh, extend his welcome. So my name is Steve Koenig. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for Marathon. I'm located currently in Sacramento, but I spent the first 12 years of my career working here at the, uh, the Marathon Carson Refinery. So it's near and dear to my heart. So we're here to celebrate Senator Bradford. Come on, for his continual focus on the livelihood for the people in the 35th. 
I can tell you, I, I see the senator every day working in Sacramento, and he does work tirelessly and consistently for uh, the people of the district. I joke with him a lot, but I'm not joking about that one. So I know you guys don't want to listen to me talk uh, to go on and on about marathon contributions in the 35th, but there are a few points I really do want to hit um, and how they add to the vitality of the district. Um, as many of you may or may not know, Marathon is an important provider of transportation fuels that move our daily lives and, and you know, power our economy. You might know us by Arco or Tesoro or Endeavor, but however you, are, you know us by, the fact is we've been in this community for a long time, you know, over 100 years to be precise. Isn't that precise? Um, you know, we provide reliable, affordable, wanted to hear a chuckle on the affordable part. <laughs> I guess I didn't get it. Uh, transportation fuels, right? They're really manufactured in the most environmentally conscious manner anywhere in the world. Um, you know, these fuels drive cars, trucks, planes, ships that make all our everyday, everyday life possible. And we do it with 1,500 employees here in the district. Um, they, they work here in the district. They're represented by the United Steel Workers for, for all our uh, plant people that operate the plant. Our industry has a huge multiplier, right? I mean, if you look at the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics stats, it's somewhere between a five and eight times multiplier on direct jobs. That doesn't even count the indirect jobs, right? The people going out to lunch. Um, these are all trades jobs. All our, our maintenance work and major work is done by the building trades. And, and these all represent living wage jobs that are six figure jobs. Um, you know, you, it's, a, it's an industry that you could get into with a high school education and make six figures. They're transitional jobs for veterans. We hire a lot of veterans, incarcerated, formerly incarcerated people. Um, and, and my only point is that these are, are jobs that provide a path for communities to thrive. And then while important, while driving these important fuels, uh, you know, the industry is an economic powerhouse for the 35th district for, for the County of Los Angeles. The LA refinery plays close to 40 million in property taxes. And that doesn't count all the, uh, the payroll taxes for the jobs that I just met. And, and the importance there is it drives you know, the, the public services, police, fire, hospitals. So you know, our engagement in, in the community is, is paramount. Uh, I know many of you in this room know Olga Chavez. Uh, I should probably say should know and love Olga Chavez. Um, Olga couldn't be here. She uh, she chose uh, Councilmember Busciano uh, over uh, <laughs> Senator Bradford. Uh, you can take that up with her. Uh, but you know she's instrumental when it comes to community engagement. Um, her, her energy is infectious. If you guys all run into her, you know that. And you know whether it's events like Sheriff Fest, which I was going to show you, the Boys and Girls Clubs, the YMCA, she's always there, and she always brings the marathon volunteers with her. Um, you know she's been responsible for over three million dollars community investment in this region in the last uh, couple, over the last couple of years. Spoke to Olga yesterday, and she stepped out. She was interviewing uh, candidates for our, our marathon summer youth program, which we've been doing for twenty years, for over twenty years. So it provides an internship for thirty-five local high school youth to work alongside professionals and craft staff at the refinery at the Marathon Carson Refinery. Um, it's a program that I am very proud of. I mean, it, it's been around for quite a while, and I mean, it gives a fantastic experience to young adults that makes them, you know, gives them the experience, makes them confident, so lets them enter the working load world and be, you know, successful in life. So um, on a different note, um, I'm also especially proud of environmental stewardship. I left this shameless promotion on everybody's chair, but it really is actually interesting. If you look at, at some of the, the environmental benefits, and there's community benefits in here as well, but there's a lot of stuff in here. Right? We hold ourselves to a very high standard um, of continuous improvement in the environmental area and, and, and as well as at the corporate level. I mean, we've done things like reduce flaring by 75%. We have a state-of-the-art fence line monitors, monitoring system, publicly accessible, available 24 seven real time. Uh, we have community alert system uh, that in, this, in the uh, area. So we, we've got a lot of improvements that we're working on and there are a lot more. Um, on the corporate level, we have real GHG targets, right? Climate change is a significant issue. 
dramatic issue. We have real and enforceable targets out there. I'm really proud to announce it. Just this week, we received, uh, as well as Phillips, um, received authorization for renewable diesel projects in Northern California and the city of Martinez. These are $1.4 billion, 4 million man hour projects, both of them, that, uh, that will provide very low carbon fuels, reductions of 40 to 75% emissions um, from those projects. And Southern California will be a beneficiary to those. So those fuels will be making their way down here. So, I mean, our industry, you know, along with many other industries and businesses is not without our challenges. We have, face it, we have opponents that would like to see us shut down, maybe rather see us gone. Um, they place tremendous uh, pressure on state and local elected officials and regulators. Um, and, and I think many times exacerbate the issues that, that they're seeking to remedy. So it, it is really important for those of you in business out there, um, in the business community, I mean, to ensure we have a responsible, sustainable, and equitable future that, you know, provides those economic benefits that allow the communities that thrive. So I'd say, you know, Marathon and, and the industry is, you know, actually part of the future energy solution and maybe not the villains that we're always painted out to be. So I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it up. Um, I'm very proud to work for Marathon Petroleum. Uh, I'm proud for what Marathon does for the 35th district. So I will stop there. Um, and at this point, turn it over to Trini Jimenez from Watson Land. Who, before we get to our keynote speaker, Senator Bradford. So thank you and enjoy. So Trini had to step Sorry. away with an emergency, but he gave us a video to use. So uh, let me uh, switch my MC hat to my um, AV kid hat. And I'm also putting this on Zoom so that we can record it for future generations. The light person, but I don't know where the lights are. <laughs> Double take. Oh, there. Yeah. And roll tape. Q talent. We're here at Catskill Elementary School, uh, which is one of uh, one of the, the, the critical schools in the community, uh, trying to to help and give back. Uh, we specifically chose this school because it uh, serves one of the lower income areas of the city. But we were interested in partnering both with Sharefest and a local school like Catskill Avenue Elementary because it's just one more example of what Watson does best and that's partner with the communities where we operate. We're doing really three projects, uh, two mural uh, repaints, uh, which, are, which are really neat. Uh, one's inside a corridor, one's outside that you can see behind me. And then uh, just over the back of the, the building behind me, we've, uh, we've replanted a, a garden, a succulent garden, an herb garden, uh, a rose garden, and we've given the kids some, uh, some areas to plant and nurture uh, seedlings for, uh, for next season. It's just Watson's way of giving back to the community. And if you've been here for any length of time, Watson is a company that always likes to pay it forward. One, one of the neat stories about today, uh, which I didn't know when we, when we booked uh, the engagement, was that one of our own teammates, Myra Lamb, went to elementary school here. This is her school. Um, I was excited to come here today because this is my elementary school. So it brings back a lot of memories, walking down the halls and um, seeing the little kids and how excited they are to see us painting the mural in there. And it just brings joy. Watson and Company actually uh, encourages you and expects you to get involved in the community at either whether you mentor kids in high school, whether you uh, volunteer at a hospital or, you know, even within the company. So for them, it's, it's super important to to get the employees out in the community. So we get a feel for all the needs that's out there. Being a part of the community is part of Watson's DNA. Our, the history of our company is where we go back to the Spanish land grants. We are stewards of the land that is part of our history. And so I think that really carries through in our culture. Every single person here is involved in some aspect of our community and in a big way. This is my community. I mean, I'm, I, I work two miles from home. Uh, I live on the block that I grew up on. 
And so that's important to me because a lot of times when you give a big corporate donation but you don't show a presence, it's not the same. From the community standpoint, you can't do enough of this stuff because you can only touch a small sliver of a, of a big bus, uh, bustling city like Carson uh, in one day. And we can't do it every day, but we wish we could. Uh, so it's, it's a constant effort to keep reinforcing our commitment to the community by doing things like this. So, oh, we need the lights again. Never let them say that the chamber kept you in the dark. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to tell a little Senator Bradford story that he probably doesn't even know of something that he did. And he's going to go, oh, uh, But anyway, the way that he impacted me that uh, was, has been very helpful to me and something very important. So, a chance to thank you publicly for this. Um, so some years back, I knew him from uh, when he was councilman in City of Gardena and also working with Southern California Edison. And um, I was a staff person through the South Bay City's Council of Governments and got to work with him quite a bit. And also through the Edison side with economic development and all the things going on, working with Lance and Jeannie and, and our whole team. And I remember in some meeting, somebody said, oh, well, how are you arranging this, this, and this? And he said, oh, well, it's simple. I'm just going to do that. And then I got to be there. Anyway, he, he showed me that we could do a lot more. You know, you can get out there and, and you can do more than you think. So Bill Smith looked at me like, you know, that's always his goal. You can always do 10 times more than we think, right? So it was a lot based on that that I decided to run for city council in Lomita. And I won, which my wife wasn't so happy with that part. <laughs> um, but I want you to know that you were one of the people who was responsible for uh, encouraging me to do that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lena to do an official welcome. Thank you, Barry. Senator Stephen Bradford. Stephen Bradford brings a lifetime of experience to the Southern California Senate. In over two decades of public service, first as a Gardena City Councilman, then as a State Assemblyman, and now as a State Senator, Bradford had, has proven himself to be a great citizen activist and public servant. He made history when he became the first African-American elected to the Gardena City Council. As a member of the assembly, Bradford had 43 bills signed into law. Currently, he is chair of the Senate Public Safety Committee, as well as the chair of the California Legislative Black Caucus. Senator Bradford was recently appointed as a member of the California's task force to study and develop reparations proposal for African-Americans by Senate President Pro Tem Tony Atkins. Senator Bradford is an advocate for criminal justice reform, diversity and inclusion, empowering underserved communities and bringing equity to the cannabis industry. Last year, Senator Bradford had seven bills signed into law, including SB2, the Kenneth Ross Jr. Police Decertification Act of 2021, creating a statewide process to revoke a peace officer certification and SB 796, allowing the County of Los Angeles to return Bruce's Beach to the remaining descendants of the Bruce family. Prior to his service in local and state government, Bradford was a public affairs manager for Southern California Edison, district director for the late Congresswoman Juanita Millender McDonald, program director for the LA Conservation Corps, national director of Bigger and Better Business for Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity, and worked for seven years as a marketing and sales representative for International Business Machines Corporation, IBM. Bradford is the chair and founder of the Gardena Jazz Festival. 
The festival will celebrate its 19th annual event this year. And it's and is one of the most popular events in the South Bay. Bradford grew up in Gardena, where he resides to this day. He coached football and baseball for 16 years in Gardena's Parks and Recreation League. Bradford attended San Diego State University, and he earned a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from California State University, Dominguez Hill. <laughs> also served on the board of the Mervyn M. Dimely African American Political and Economic Institute, a nonpartisan public policy think tank. Please welcome Senator Stephen Bradford. Thank you, Ms. Whitaker. Give her a round of applause for us all. I'm very glad for this chamber uh, on a daily basis. And thank you for that introduction. I mean, I would like to take you on the road with me because my mother doesn't introduce me that well, but I appreciate it. And one thing you failed to mention, I was part of this chamber for 12 years. I, I, was, I was on this chamber board for 12 years, so I know the great work that this chamber has done and will continue to do. And so I'm honored to be here today. And really, I didn't know this was a Steve Bradford really day. I thought it was all of our elected officials who were going to be here giving updates. And then they said, no, it's just you. You stayed in the 35th Senate District, but I really don't have anything to talk about because uh, we haven't done anything in the last, no, I'm just joking. Y'all <laughs> got it all serious. But I can look around at every one of these tables in this room, and it's someone at all these tables that have touched my life, whether it's Gil Smith, the first elected official here in Carson, the founder of the city, a, a man who gave me encouragement and inspired me to run for office. I mean, really a true pioneer in this city. I mean, I can go around Harold Williams. I mean, I mean, come on. He was out here on the forefront. I mean, my former mayor here, Albert Robles. I mean, we're, I mean, we were in the trenches together. I can go around and around and around. So I thank all of you for being here today. My good friend Cedric Hicks, councilman here in the city of Carson, give him a round of applause for Tamara you know, Lewis. We sat on boards together too, and all what she does at Dignity Health Center. But uh, I'm here real quick just to really uh, talk about what we're doing in the 35th Senate District. And um, as stated by Ms. Whitaker, mentioned last year was a good year for me, but it was a slow year for me because that was the first time I only had seven bills signed. And, and I'm like, wow, I, my number went down, but we were only allowed to introduce 12 due to the pandemic. Whereas now I have 20 bills that are making its way through the Senate and uh, hopefully through the assembly and to the governor's desk. But uh, as she stated, she mentioned some, and I realized nobody cl clapped on SB2. I wonder why that was the case. Nobody clapped on SB2. And really, and, and I'm not saying that you sh should have, but I'm just saying, that was monumental too, for being able to bring police reform here in the state of California. We were one of only 46 states, okay? And we pride ourselves on leading the way on everything, the environment, the economy, technology, but we were behind 46 other states when it came to real police reform. And I respect everyone here in this uniform, and I thank you guys for being here today. I have family members who put that uniform on. You know the friends I have in your department, Captain. We get opportunity to spend time, but we have to know if there's bad teachers, there's bad politicians, there's bad doctors, there's bad lawyers, there have to be bad police officers as well. And it puts a stain on those good men and women who put this uniform every day and do the job. So SB2 was life-changing because it was named after Kenneth Ross Jr., a young man who grew up in my neighborhood. His grandfather still is around the corner from me, and he was running from the police, not running toward, running from. And I've grown up in Gardena my entire life. I've been on first-name basis with the last four police chiefs. I've known almost every officer on that department since they were a rookie. And when I heard about that shooting, I said, that's not Gardena. I said, that's not the character of Gardena, only to find out it was the officer who had transferred from Orange County who had been in three questionable shootings there. And without 
police to certification, we are allowed to do the wash, rinse, and repeat. We allow officers to commit heinous crimes and transfer before anything happens to them and get rehired. So that will, that's the end of that. So that's all the reason I said that. But uh, also fair pay to play. And, and, and I, say, I, I chair public safety and I wanna make sure our officers are just as safe as our citizens. And people talk about defunding the police. That's never come out of my mouth. We want to reallocate funds and make sure police have the resources they need. And we want to make sure people are properly trained because black and brown people call on the police more so than any other community. But we want safe, reliable, and responsible policing in our community. So we, we are totally on the same accord. But uh, she also mentioned SB 206, uh, uh, name, image, and likeness that I authored uh, three years ago. And it changed the life of college athletes. It allows college athletes to monetize their name, image, and likeness, not likeness, just like any other student on campus. Many folks are unaware if you are on scholarship and say you had a computer science degree and you develop an app, you can monetize that. You can sell it. Asked uh, uh, Zuckerberg, he was in college when he developed Facebook and he was able to monetize that. Today he's a billionaire. But if you are a college athlete on scholarship, you can't go out and have a, a, a workshop on football or basketball. You can't even sign your name to a jersey and get compensated for it. And why is that? So we changed that. SB 206 changed it and it's changed college sports all across the nation. So I'm excited about that. And we just gave it a little face look last year. And one of the bills that I've introduced this year will expand upon that. And it's uh, allowing athletes now to be paid. And uh, so, well, how does that happen? We're seeing of the revenue generating sports that make a profit, be it basketball and football, 50% over your profit should be, should be put into an annuity and set aside to incentivize these college athletes to stay in school and graduate. And if they graduate within a six year window, they will re uh, receive $25,000. We think that's fair. We think that's fair, but the universities are opposing it. USC for one example, I mean, great institution. I mean, we got plenty of folks who went to USC in this room and I love USC, but I did a tour two weeks ago because they were trying to convince me the bill wasn't necessary and they took me around their facilities. I mean, state of art. I know probably some pro programs don't have a program as nice as USC, but their total scholarship for all their scholarship athletes is $21 million. They have, I think, 12 full-time coaches. They make $21 million. So don't tell me there's no profit in sports at USC. So we're just saying, share a percentage of those profits, put it in a, a, a annuity fund, and uh, incentivize these students to stay in and graduate. So that's one. Another uh, piece of legislation I've introduced is vehicle stops. As we've seen all across this nation, it's not a California issue, it's all across this nation, that an individual gets stopped by simply because his traffic light doesn't work or his blinker doesn't work, and it escalates into something else. We saw it in Minnesota with, uh, what's my young man who had the freshener, you know, air freshener hanging over the window and wind up losing his life from that. We're saying, let's eliminate that. Officers have more things to do than stop somebody because your blinker didn't work, you know, or, you know, your headlights out. So we're saying, let's em eliminate that. And it's had bipartisan support. It was my Republican colleague who, uh, suggested this to me. He says, hey, man, we're, we're wasting a whole lot of law enforcement time making unnecessary stops. So hopefully we'll get that through both houses and get it to the governor's desk because we saw what happened when I say with Sandra Bland in Texas. I mean, these were unnecessary vehicle stops and she winds up losing her life um, mysteriously, uh, you know, after being arrested. Um, another piece of legislation, 1401, uh, well, that's the one that dealing with uh, college degrees for, I mean, uh, revenue and incentivizing athletes to get a college degree. Um, SB 1273 would give school officials and administrators and teachers the discretion of when to call law enforcement. We've seen in the last two months, kindergartens being handcuffed. We saw a eight-year-old being handcuffed in 
some state. We're saying we don't need to call the cops just because a kid had a tantrum in, in a room. You know, let the school administrators deal with it. Right now, they're required to call law enforcement. I commend uh, George McKenna, who's an elected school board member for LA Unified. He was the first one to say, hey, let's get uniform officers off campuses. You know what I'm saying? Let's make schools be schools, but do we need safety? Without a doubt, because we saw just what happened uh, three weeks ago in Stockton with a young lady who lost her life because somebody drove on campus and stabbed her to death. They just hit her uh, services yesterday in Stockton. So we do need safety, but we're just saying give teachers a, a little bit of discretion so they don't have to call the police because we know many times it's black and brown kids. And if we start having interactions with law enforcement, at elementary school, chances are it's going to lead to that school to prison pipeline. So we're trying to avoid that if all possible. Uh, another piece of legislation is SB 1293, uh, which uh, removes the taxes. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, uh, on cannabis. We're trying to make this industry safe and it's legal. It's passed by over 60% of the vote in 2016. And whether you like it or not, it's legal in California. So let's make it fair where these businesses who are now trying to open up can afford to keep their doors open because the taxes are so absorbent right now. It's only encouraging the legal market to flourish. And that's what's dominating in the market right now. We're seeing, hey, we promise all this tax revenue to the state of California, but if nobody's coming into these legalized shops and they're buying it illegally, then we're defeating the purpose. So we're trying to reduce the excise tax from 15% to 5% and remove the cultivation tax. We seem to be in good discussion with the governor right now to make sure that it thrives. And, and right now, if you are uh, have a, a, a dispensary, you pay taxes in advance of your inventory. Who does that? You don't pay taxes in advance in a grocery store when you order your eggs and all that. And you, you pay at point of sale. And that's what we're trying to say with this as well. Apply the tax at point of sale because this is driving up costs too. So inventory, cannabis inventory has a shelf life just like your milk, your eggs and everything else. And if you don't sell it, you got to throw it away. But you've already paid taxes on that which you are winding up throwing away. But different, again, in grocery stores, if your eggs go bad, you just throw them away. You haven't paid taxes on that. You don't pay taxes till you sell. So that's one of the things we're working on too. Another one is the Jumpstart Act uh, to incentivize private capital investments in small business and minority-owned and women-owned businesses. I've always been a strong advocate of uh, minority participation. Uh, just uh, four years ago, when we passed the gas tax, SB1, uh, one of the conditions for me voting for that, I said, I gotta make sure that people of color, our disabled veterans and our women have a seat at the table. And Jerry Brown spent around when he was in committee and he agreed upon that, and he agreed upon it so much so that we did what? We brought Jerry Brown to Cal State to make the seals four years ago, and he invited 400 minority contractors, women-owned businesses, and we're hope hopefully we're living up to the commitment of that. Um, but I'm hearing that it's still a lot of women and minorities not getting the business opportunities that we hope for, but we're still going to fight for it. So uh, we're trying to incentivize that as well. And I know we have some folks with the water board, Harold Williams, uh, Vera DeWitt, it's also uh, I introduced a, a bill that helps uh, with water rates. So hopefully we'll get that to the governor's desk. And uh, one bill that I'm really proud of is SB 1334, meal breaks for our public sector and UC nurses. My mother's a retired nurse. I have two nieces that are nurses. And we want to make sure that not only are, are the patient ratios fair, but these hardworking individuals who are the front line, who are taking care of our most vulnerable, our sick, our frail, our seniors, get proper rest breaks, get proper lunch breaks. So it's common sense, but right now it's not being enforced. And another one is 1371, fair and just wages for incarcerated workers. I mean, you know what the average inmate makes an hour in prison. Uh, somebody said something. About six, somewhere between three to six cents. If you're lucky, some make eight cents. And we're trying to bring it up to $2. And, and we say this is because the average person who's incarcerated has restitution. He has child support, he or she has child support. But you also have to buy your hygiene materials and stuff from the canteen. And uh, it's estimated that at three cents 
a year, I mean, a three cent an hour, you can work for 22 years and still not pay off $6,000 worth of restitution. Something's wrong with that. So, and people thinking, oh, you're trying to enrich inmates. No, we're not. We're just making sure when they leave, they're not still in debt. And while they're there, they can survive or you don't have to have the illegal contraband ban that comes in prisons every day that we all know about it. Another piece of legislation, I'm not the author of, but my colleague, uh, Cindy Kamlager is. What's the number on the one that you just talked about? Uh, 1371. 1371. Uh-huh. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, and uh, Senator Cindy Kamlager, I believe her bill is 1304. And that's gate money. Anybody know what gate money is? It's the amount of money that you're given when you're released from prison. Anybody know how much it is? $200. No know when that was set? 1973. Tell me anybody in here could, you know, who could survive off of what you made or if you were around in 1973. Okay? And you're releasing people on the street with $200 in, in their pocket. Sydney Kalmager, it's one of the uh, uh, pieces of legislation that we're supporting through the legislative black caucus. Again, I'm the chair of the caucus. We're trying to increase it to $2,500. And, you know, it's only common sense to afford you the opportunity. You need a motel or a hotel for a week or two until you get on your feet, you get home. I mean, but $200 is gone as soon as you walk out the gate. You need a cell phone, can't afford it. So. We're trying to raise it to 2,500 again, a, a rate that has been set for over uh, 50 years and it's time to change it. So that's one of the things that we're working on too. And uh, what else? I don't know, what else? You said you want to leave it open for some, well, one thing is also 1371, I mean, 1317, uh, it's a pawn broker consumer privacy uh, bill. It's aimed at protecting pawn customers from their identity, identity being, uh, put out in the universe. So we just want to narrow that down to what kind of information is available. Still want to make it available to law enforcement if they're uh, dealing with stolen goods and store, but don't put the uh, individual's private information, their you know, driver's license, their home address, all that stuff. We don't want that to be uh, shared. So uh, that's what we're working on as well, uh, making sure third party uh, individuals doesn't get that. And another uh, piece of legis legislation is uh, SB 1021. Uh, DUI misdemeanor diversions, uh, giving first time offenders the opportunity. Does it make it mandatory to have an uh, uh, ignition device installed to their car? And if they successfully uh, pass the program, they don't get the points on their driver's license. It still shows up as a DUI, but you don't get the points, which you know increases your taxes. I mean, and your insurance on a, on, a month, on a monthly and annual basis. So we're just trying to avoid that. And a budget priority, uh, uh, Lena mentioned uh, uh, SB 796, which was returning uh, Bruce's Beach to the Bruce family, a historic uh, piece of uh, legislation, but it's opened up a lot of uh, other discussions. And how many folks are familiar with Allensworth? Allensworth, every hand in this room should have gone up, but Allensworth was an historical black town that was founded in uh, 1908, just in Tulare County, just north of Bakersfield, by Colonel Allen's Allensworth, an African American uh, uh, chaplain and uh, military officer. And he started this town in 1908. And it was a thriving town, founded by African Americans, governed by African Americans, financed by African Americans. It was Colonel Allensworth's intention to make that Tuskegee of the West. He had planned on bringing a university there. But in 1914, Colonel, uh, Colonel Allensworth, unfortunately, was struck by a car just south, of, I mean, north of here in downtown LA, and he died. And sh shortly after, uh, surrounding communities start doing what they usually do when it's people of color and they, just, they cut off the train stop from the, from the town. They poisoned the well where they couldn't uh, grow crops and uh, raise livestock. And by 1914, uh, the town was completely just devastated and, and eliminated for the most part. And we're seeking 50 million. It's now a state park, but by the show of hands, many folks didn't know that and surely haven't visited there. 
And if you were to go there, it wouldn't be any state park that you're accustomed to visiting. It's, even if you want to come with your trailer or your mobile home, there's no hookups for them. It's I, very few amenities. They have a few of the structures that existed in 1908 that are still there. But if we're going to call it a state park, it needs to be worthy of you know recognition, especially its historic impact here in California. So we're trying to secure 50 million so we can invest in Allensworth just the same way we invest in Yosemite and any of our other state parks here across the state. So that's one of our priorities as well. And um, I'll leave it at that. They said there's going to be some questions and answers. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy. But I also want to follow up on Steve Koenig and the work that Marathon and Phillips 66 is doing because we hear all the time about, oh, we got to leave oil in the ground. They're major polluters and stuff like that. How many know who founded this city? This city, Carson. Who, who found it? Okay, that's the lineage part of it from the, uh, but it was Atlantic Richfield Company that put up the resources for the city to be founded. It was a fight between the city of LA and uh, I think Long, I forgot who wanted to incorporate them. And no, they stood on their own and Atlantic Richfield helped put up the money. So I'm seeing this town would not exist. This city would not exist if it wasn't for the marathons, the Phillips 66s, the Atlantic Richfield companies. And we need to know that history. And as Steve stated, I worked for an environmental nonprofit and I'm passionate about having clean water, clean air, clean soil. But sometimes we overstate the risks and exposures when they do it far better today than they did 10 years ago, let alone 20 years ago, let alone 50 years ago. And we need to recognize that. I was able to take it, uh, visit in Lafayette, what, about two months ago, Steve? And we went up to Lafayette, Northern California, and we built, visited a Phillips 66 plant. And they're doing hydrogen, renewable energy, re renewable fuel. They're doing it clean. They're doing it efficiently. And it's state of the art, but nobody wants to talk about that. So we are getting better at all those things. And I don't know a single person in this room who wants dirty air, dirty water, dirty soil. No one wants that. And, and, and I say we're challenged with being better stewards and leaving this state and this country and this world better than what we found it. But many times we hear the false narratives that they're polluting and stuff like that. If we left oil in the ground, trust me, you would have no asphalt for your roads. You would have no tar for your roofs. You would have no tires. You would have none of these plastic products that you need to do whatever you do. You wouldn't have any computers because all that's made out of petroleum products, whether people want to believe it or not. So I just want to say, be cautious of what we ask for sometimes. Uh, it's not as bad as people make it out. And I had to learn that uh, a number of years ago. I took a forest tour and I'm a city guy. And I went up to Northern California to Weed and shops to California. He has a town called Weed. Uh, and, <laughs> and, it's, and it's a lumber town. It ain't, they don't grow no weed there. They, it's, all, it's all timber and weed. And I sat in a, uh, y'all know about the Hertz Castle in uh, San Simeon, but they own a property that makes it look like Kitty Land up in Weed, California. It's an amazing campus of homes and they have a major home uh, uh one big home you know mansion i guess you would call it and we're sitting in a dining room about the size of this and i'm sitting at the table with the emersons the fords uh the fishers you know from gap all the major landowners we're sitting around this table and i believe between these five fam families they owned about five million acres of timberland in northern california and they looked me in the eye and they says if we could pick up our land today and move it across the border to Oregon, we would. And I'm like, wow, that's telling. And I said, why is that? He says, because we can't cut down a tree in California. In order to cut down one tree for commercial use, you need something in California called a timber harvesting plant. You need it in Oregon, you need it in Nevada, but know how long it takes to get it in Oregon? 60 days. Not long it takes to get it in California. I mean, 
not ten years, it ain't that bad. We, we, we bad, but we not that bad. It takes three and a half to five years to get a timber harvesting plan okay by the state of California just to cut down one tree for commercial use. So when you hear about all these ongoing fires that now last weeks and weeks at time, it's because we are not cutting down trees anymore, folks. It's not because of climate change alone. It's not because of all these things. That on land that's supposed to have maybe 100 trees an acre, now have 400 trees an acre. And that's the fuel that's, you know, feeding these fires that go on and on. But nobody wants to have that conversation. And had I just stayed here in my district and not visited, I would have believed the narrative too. So we have to manage our forests a whole lot better than what we do. We don't do that. And those are all the, you know, contributing factors to much of what we see on the news and we attribute it to climate change or we contribute it to whatever, you know, the politics of the day. But we need to just do better at telling the truth. And that's one of the things I uh, try to do as an elected official is speak truth to power and just tell the truth. And, and you know, and because and, and, and I get along with all my Republican colleagues. People find it so hard to believe that, man, you're a Democrat and all the Republicans get along with you and you get along. Because at the end of the day, we all want the same thing. We might go about it differently, but they all want the same thing. They want good schools. They want safe streets. They want affordable housing. You know, we might not agree upon how we do it, but we all want the same thing. And I have to learn because the majority of the Republicans, they're the farmers and the ranchers. You know, we produce 40% of the nation's produce here in California. And a lot of my colleagues are ranchers, and they tell me, and I've learned from them. So uh, it's a lot to be learned, but we have to have conversation. That's why I'm always open to have open dialogue. So again, thank you for this opportunity. I probably went on long before, uh, longer than what I should have, and I see some nodding back there. And... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. How old am I? Oh. <laughs> Senator Bradford, I am a rental property owner, and I have, I won't say I struggle with unemployment, but I have a lot of colleagues that have, because we have people that are not paying their rent, and they continue to do so, even though they're, they're taking trips and buying cars and doing all these nice things. And it seems as though the government is really putting a lot of energy on helping tenants, but us, us landlords, we're just kind of out there. So is there anything coming up that will consider us landlords, not, not so much more than tenants, but at least have a balance? Well, I, I thank you for the question because I served on the pandemic task force, economic recovery task force uh, for the last 18 months. And the biggest issue that was discussed was rent forgiveness. And I said, time out, time out. We got to look out not only for the tenant, but for the landlord as well, because it's many people in this room who are landlords. And many times we conflated with landlords being these big conglomerates and these land barons, but many times it's just nurses, your postal workers, your local elected officials, you know, folks who've invested in their retirement, their kids' college funds, and these are not wealthy people. And as I told my colleagues, I says, if you think, you know, not paying your rent is going to just uh, protect the tenant, it's going to harm the landlord because they still have a mortgage to pay. So we did do a piece of legislation uh, last year. I forgot what the bill number was. I was a co-author of it. But it did provide landlord protection. Uh, you would be able to get your money in arrears through uh, BOE and uh, the Treasury Department. And it's out there, but a lot of landlords did not uh, apply for it. But we did create a fund where landlords could be compensated for their lost revenue up to six months. And so really, it's, it's one of those issues that we constantly talk about because we just can't look at one side of the coin. You have to look after the landlords as well. And I also uh, did a piece of legislation for the landlords with 50 units or less, you know, to give them a, a tax break too. So some of those things, because we're not, you know, 
we know who these landlords are. And they're not all wealthy people. They're not all, you know, multimillionaires and billionaires. They're regular working people, like many of you folks in this room who that happened to invest in a piece of property and you shouldn't be punished. But we haven't quite, you know, threaded that needle a hundred percent, but we're you guys are at the table, believe me. And you have the Land Apartment Owners Association of Lake uh, Malcolm Bennett, who was a fierce advocate and up until he passed last year, uh, up in the Capitol, making sure that we looked after, you know, the landlord. So we're we're looking after you. Yeah, I, you hear more about the tenants, but we are looking out after the landlord. Yes, sir. Ask Steve Koenig right there. <laughs> Uh, that has been in a discussion, but to take, uh, eliminating the state tax is, we feel, well, I should say it's some that feel that would be the direct impact. The governor is now looking at refunding uh, each California uh, $200 per person per household, up to $1,000 per household, and they're hoping that would have a, a more direct uh, impact on people's uh, wallets versus eliminating the gas tax. So. It's one of the things that's still being negotiated. It's not in stone yet, but uh, it's on the table. It's on the table. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Well, it, it, it is high places, but we do. I mean, we can't we can do better. And, and, and part of the reason our gas is so high, we have winter and we have summer blends. Again, a, something that was created by legislators well before I got here, so don't, don't look at me. But it was during Jerry Brown's first term in office as governor. And, and it was all about making cleaner gasoline, burning fuels. And, and, and we have benefited from it, but it does drive up costs. It really does. And, uh, and like you say, I'm not here to villainize uh, the petroleum uh, industry because I think they do a great job and we as elected officials are sometimes not oh you take money from oil I said yes I do I said every time my mom write me a check or uh, my uncle and aunt write me a check I'm taking oil money because we own oil property in Texas okay so I said I'm taking my mama's money so I'm taking their money too so uh, I'm all right with that I think that's more of a local uh, issue what the local the police departments uh, do with those that inventory or those cars that they compensate during criminal activities. I remember in Gardena a number of years ago, uh, the police chief was riding around, this is four police chiefs removed, was riding around in a blue, I mean a red Cadillac. I said, well, where did that come? He said, oh, we confiscated it, but he used it for parades. So I'm pretty sure they could do whatever they want with it if they want to. Donated to a nonprofit, it could, but I found out it found it kind of odd. He was riding in, in a parade. So, uh. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, is there anything that's going to be done in regards to the odor of marijuana? Um, my family lives in North Montana. We often get thin freeway between. Alameda and San Pedro. And whenever we come through there, we have to roll up the windows, turn off the air conditioner. It doesn't matter if it's 120 degrees outside because there's a plant somewhere. And I've contacted um, air quality management, no response. I've sent letters, no response. But yet, and still, people who travel down the 10 freeway are dealing with headaches and things of that sort. And, you know, no fresh air within that mile or half a mile space. Is there anything that's being done to assist people? I know that there's this thing as far as helping people to use marijuana and you know, supporting them, but what about those that don't use it and that are affected by the scents and headaches and things of that sort? 
from being near that type of activity. I mean, that's the first I've heard of this. I mean, I've heard about being around dispensaries, and that's why you can't use around dispensaries because we've heard about folks consuming and those uh, that smoke emanating and going into you know the neighborhood. And so that's why I know you can't consume on site at dispensaries. But I'm on a, you saying that's a grow. It's at a grow. And where's that grow? It's between you say where? You know what? It's somewhere off of our, uh, Alameda. And I'm thinking that it's on the south side of Alameda. It must be some large inside industrial yeah. grow. And, and yeah. really, that's one of the reasons why they encourage inside grows to kind of like suppress the older as well versus the outside grows that you have. And that's a challenge also that you have, whether you grow it inside or outside. All of that, that's the argument up in the Emerald Triangle about that. But I don't know, I'll look into it, but that's, you know, I, I'm more, I mean, again, that's more of a local issue than a state issue is the ordinance and regulations that those local communities uh, impose as it relates to. Was there someone that you could direct me to to contact? I, I first have to know where it is. If it's in, if it's in the city of LA, they do have a, Cannabis czar uh, who oversees all things cannabis. I mean, uh, City of LA does, Oakland, San Francisco, and Sacramento, but a lot of these communities don't. So, it all depends on where it is. So, it's all okay. Questions are free. All right. See, Matt, questions for Matt. What, what do you say? <laughs> well, if no more questions, I want to again. Uh, yes, sir. So, uh, well, we should encourage storage. Uh, again, we let millions of gallons of water run straight to the ocean every year. And if you go to Northern California, you have farmers who want to store and capture that water and they can't. It's against the law right now to capture rain runoff on certain areas in California. You have to let it drain straight to the ocean. I think it's the most ridiculous thing. We passed legislation about seven years ago uh, the voters did to build above ground storage and conveyance, and we have not dropped one shovel in the ground to build any of that. And we need to do so. I mean, because we just let millions of gallons flow to the ocean every year. Another thing that we need to do, and everybody says, oh, it's going to mess up the environment, is desalinization. I mean, it works. And we're the biggest desalinization plant is in the, in the world. Israel. I've been there. And it's right there in Tel Aviv, right there in the Mediterranean Sea. And it's had no impact on sea life because you have some of the best restaurants right there on the coast. And you see fishermen there every day, 100 yards from this facility, bringing in fish that they sell to some of the five-star restaurants right there in Tel Aviv. And it's had no impact on sea life. But we tell the story that it's going to impact sea life. It's going to kill. It, it doesn't. And Know where they get the filters from for their desalinization plant? Here in California, made in San Diego. So we we do all for other folks, but we won't do it for ourselves. So desal is something we need to do. Storage is something what we need to do because we've conserved in Southern California. Really, we save use more. I mean, less water today than we did 30 years ago, and it's only so much conservation you can do. Really, our, our water usage is down today lower than it was 30 years ago. And we need to pat ourselves on the back with all the environmental programs, the low flow toilets, all those things, you know, drip irrigation. But at some point, you reach a point of no return where folks can't conserve anymore. So we, we need to start saving. We need to build those reservoirs that uh, the voters approved about seven years ago. And we, we still haven't done that. So. That's part of the challenge. Challenge there too. Pass. I'm ready for a little nap or something. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.
Thank you, Mr. Wade. Much appreciated. Let's give him another hand. He's been working hard for our communities for a long time and making a difference, um, as do many of you. And so, appreciations to all of you. A chamber is the strength of a chamber is that people get involved from different sectors and come together and make more than any of us can individually. So, okay, raise your hand from, from the water industry here. I see a lot of my water friends. Okay, how who's from um, Petrochem Industries? So yes, I'm bringing that together. Healthcare. Uh, you know, it, we have a lot of different companies. SA Recycling's got a full gang over there. So. Law enforcement. We have our we have our local government folks. We have Sydney Health Sports Park. Sorry, you're in your own category, but it's a great category. How about our nonprofits? The strength of the chamber is when we work together to get something done. So it's when you let us know that LAUSD was doing a program on Saturday where for uh, students who had been admitted to colleges and they did this at Cal State Dominguez Hills and they needed some giveaways. And so we put it out to our membership and then Tamela says, hey, we got something over here we can do. And Vera, meanwhile, is working on providing them water. And it's all these different parts together. And it's then bringing people together that gets things done. We've been working with Darren on his big project. Thank God we're finally going to have something on that 180 acre site. So, my first job with City of Carson when I was hired in 1987, my first task was to write a letter to Al Davis saying we're sorry his deal with Irwindale fell through, but if he'd still like to come to Carson and talk about that project here, you know, we'd still love to talk to him. So in 1987, you're just laughing because you, know, you remember, yeah. And then we had Ferrante after that, and then and anyway, but so it's been a lot of work, but here it is, you know, everybody's coming together on this and we're gonna make it happen. And so that's the kind of progress that we need and working together, uh, last week, uh, Chick-fil-A was having a problem with one of their employees being harassed by a, a former boyfriend. And so we contacted the sheriff's department and said, hey, what are we doing? They put them in contact with some resources to help with an intervention to get something done. You know, it's making those, dealing with those little problems, dealing with those big problems. So YMCA the other day, they wanted to talk to somebody at the mall about doing a, what was it? A wellness program. And so sure enough, Jesse at the mall, you know, it's just by working together. And so Amy and I have it very easy that we just get to connect all of you guys. And it's a lot of fun and we appreciate it. And we appreciate all of you. Um, so do you have anything else you want to add, Lena? Quarterly breakfast in June. So that was a long quarter. We're gonna make the future quarter shorter. And I did want to mention the table five. You didn't eat enough of your dessert. You will sit there until you finish that. No talking. Let's be more eating. Let's talk. Oh, sorry. My mom coming through there. So with that, we thank you all very much for coming and we look forward to seeing you again soon. <laughs>